Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, addressing skills shortage and upskilling. My name is Alicia Prince. I'm the General Manager of the Victoria Division, and I will be your host today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, La Trobe University. La Trobe University's industry-led education program achieves 95% in overall employment outcomes for graduates. The university works closely with industry to ensure its education programs offered at La Trobe's Melbourne and Bendigo campuses equip graduates with the practical and technical skills they need to succeed in a dynamic, fast-paced profession. The goal is to produce graduates of the highest calibre who have gained real-world experience through work-integrated learning, industry projects and real contact with industry leaders. La Trobe University is also educating the next generation of regional engineers, supplying Victorian industries with a graduate pipeline and skilled workforce capability. Today we will hear from two speakers, followed by our live audience question and answer session, and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Kyle McLean. Kyle comes with 14 years experience in the talent acquisition and recruitment space and has spent the last four years with Metro Trains Melbourne as their talent acquisition manager across the major projects division, supporting some of Victoria's largest infrastructure projects as part of the state government's Big Build program. Being part of forward thinking programs to support our current skills shortage whilst using out of the box thinking has never been more important for the future to come. Please welcome Kyle McLean. Hi there, everyone. My name is, is Kyle McLean. Um, I'm the Strategic Talent Acquisition Programs Lead for Metro Trains Melbourne, um, and really excited uh, today to talk to you um, on the skill shortage topic that we have in mind today. Um, a little bit of background uh, in regards to myself um, and uh, Firstly, just wanted to again thank Engineers Australia and also La Trobe University for inviting me to speak through um, the presentation today. Um, so, as I said, a little bit about myself, Colin McLean, Strategic Talent Acquisition Programs Lead. I have spent the last four years um, as the Talent Acquisition Manager for Metro Trains Melbourne, heading up their um, projects, major projects division. Um, prior to that, have travelled around Western Australia, um, Northern Territory, New South Wales, and now landed here in Victoria um, with around about 13 plus years experience working in talent acquisition. So I've got a really big passion for um, attraction, retention, and developing our people. Um, and something that obviously Latrobe and Eddie will speak about a bit later um, around the program that they're looking to um, looking to kick off the ground is around how can we um, bring more diverse talent into our organizations um, and something that i'm really really passionate about um, having spent as i said 13 plus years experience um, as talent acquisition um, around multiple different states and working on a number of major construction projects um, offshore oil and gas projects mining projects uh, in western australia in particular i've come across a number of talented professional, excellent engineers. Um, so a really passionate place for, for me um, in terms of what I um, am involved in and what I look for in terms of um, that next generation of talent in particular. Um, in terms of the, the talent global, um, the global talent shortage in particular, I um, have never seen anything like this uh, before. I spent a number of years, as I said, in Western Australia uh, during the height of the mining boom and this has really topped it. So really excited, um, as I said, to share some insights from, from my end to hear see Eddie's presentation a little bit later uh, and to hopefully answer some questions that you might have down the track. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I also pay our respects to elders from other communities and all leaders um, here today on the call. 
Firstly, I wanted to touch on Metro Trains values um, in particular, just to sort of set the scene in terms of the context. Um, these won't be really much different to your organization's uh, values that you've got usually built on four or five different pillars. Ours and Metro Trains are zero harm, caring, one team, dependable, and make a difference. In that far right corner, make a difference, probably something that we'll focus on a little bit more today in terms of um, trying to improve in what we do. Um, here as well. But as I mentioned, um, what we look for when we are bringing people into Metro Trains as an organisation is built on these foundational values. Um, I'll talk about Metro um, as a bit of a shameless plug. Um, that's the talent acquisition side of me coming out um, uh, in terms of trying to sort of promote Metro as an organisation and then get into a bit more of the nitty gritty. So you may or may not be aware, but Metro is the operator and maintainer of the, the rail network here in Victoria. Um, we've been, uh, this is our second franchise, um, so MR3 is where we started in 2009. Um, in 2017, we were awarded what we call an MR4 franchise agreement, and that'll take us through to 2024. Uh, recently, we've been awarded another 18-month extension, uh, which is great news for the business and for the state. Um, a little known fact, um, unless you work for Metro, is that MTR, um, John Holland and UGL, are actually three major shareholders with, with Metro as an organization. So I get a lot of questions around us being a government agency. Yes, we've got really strong links and ties uh, to the government. However, we are privately owned 60% um, NTR, 20% John Holland, 20% UGL. In terms of the, the divisions that we've got here at Metro Trains Melbourne, we've got three main divisions um, that we work through. So we've got um, a division called our Projects Division, um, which is the, the one that I've been prominently been a part of over the last uh, four years. We've got, we, we support the big build program of work. So namely your level crossing removal project, your metro tunnel project, um, and smaller franchisee projects. We've got a division called our Network Assets and Assurance Division. So we've got an engineering arm of our business, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, our Chief Engineer, um, Phil Ellingworth, and our Deputy Chief Engineer, Anthony Hart. Rolling Stock obviously looks after our fleet of trains um, with a bunch of new trains coming in the HCMT space um, and also some new Extrapols 2.0 trains coming. Our infrastructure teams um, who go off and, and do a lot of the maintenance and renewals, our technology teams, and then some subsidiary train, our teams within NANA. Our biggest division that we've got within Metro Trains is our operations and passion delivery divisions. So these are the people that you see each and every day out on our network, your station staff, your train drivers, your customer service people, um, authorised officers, uh, those types of people that are sort of day-to-day -day, uh, making the network run. Um, so heavily involved in um, the operational, as I said, side of the business. In terms of the types of roles that we, were, that we employ here at Metro Trains, so we're very diverse and unique in the sense that we've got a mix of really technically specialised type roles, as you can imagine. Um, as well as our sort of um, customer service, um, blue collar, unionized type workforce as well. So in projects, we've got things like engineering, project management, supervisory, um, in NANA, um, so network assets and assurance, we've got our engineering department, we've got development teams, we've got our electricians, our SMTs, um, and in operations, training, train drivers, authorized officers, and customer service. So that's just a little bit of a scope about Metro Trains as an organisation. As I said, that's the recruiter in me coming out and shamelessly plugging um, Metro as an organisation. What I'd really like to talk to you next about is actually the topic we're here to, to address, um, and that's addressing the skill shortage um, in terms of what we can do uh, moving forward. A um, number of different speech bubbles here on the screen um, that you're looking at at the moment. Um, I'll touch on each of them uh, to give you a bit of insight into what um, I've done and what the business is doing from a, a skill shortage perspective. As mentioned, I worked very heavily within the mining industry in terms of that skills gap um, and the need for skills during the height of the mining boom. Um, and this is just the same, if not um, a little bit worse, especially in that technical space uh, in particular. So there's a number of different things that we can do and what we have been doing as an organization to really address, address these. So first one on the top left, partnerships and programs, um, and a really, really um, key factor in terms of addressing skill shortages. Um, just as Eddie will present to you in a little bit, um, of the program that we're trying to run and other programs that I've been part of um, have a really strong place um, within our industry to really address this skill shortage. 
So an example I can give you is Metro Trains have been involved in the Engineering's Pathway Industry Cadetship, or EPIC for short, um, which supports asylum seeker and refugees um, across um, a number of different engineering disciplines. Come and get an 18, it's an 18 month program, come and get a qualification as well as practical knowledge um, on, the, uh, on the ground on some of our major projects. This is um, in partnership with our Level Crossing Training for the Future team. Um, and a really successful program been run over the last three or four years uh, in particular. So something that I think is really important, these structured programs, uh, these structured um, environments that these communities can come into, feel supported, feel safe, and feel like they can thrive is really, really um, a strong way to be able to get these cohorts to be successful in the workforce moving forward. In terms of partnerships, so, um, Metro Trains has a lot of affiliation with companies such as Career Seekers, Asylum Seeker Ref uh, Resource Centre, um, a lot of job placement um, companies as well uh, through Jobs Victoria. And there are a lot of different partnerships out there um, that businesses can be a part of. So it's not something that you have to do all on your own. I encourage you to reach out to your networks, uh, reach out and find out what partnerships are out there to be able to see if we can uh, address some of these skill shortages. Culture Ad is the next one. and, and I. I it's a terminology that I've just recently started using. So culture ad instead of culture fit um, when trying to address skill shortage and bring people into your organization. Um, I think culture fit has probably got more of a, I not say negative connotation to it at the moment, but it's certainly evolved a little bit more. And what we want to try and do is, is bring people into our organization that are going to add to the culture rather than having to fit what the culture already is. Um, education and throughout my presentation, you'll hear me talk about education. Um, and what I mean by education is education of the business, education of the managers, education of the leaders in terms of how we're going to address skill shortages, whether it's bringing in diverse talent into your organization um, or whether it's convincing a hiring manager to think outside the box in terms of its recruitment strategy. Education with the business is really, really key. Um, I really key point of that education is that, you know, we, um, people teams and um, talent acquisition teams and whatever type of team you're in in that space can put together as many programs uh, and strategies as possible uh, to try and attract people um, to address the skill shortage. But unless the leaders within the organization have got that buy-in and actually want to make that change, uh, it's really, really difficult to make that change. So I encourage you um, as leaders within the organization, uh, but also as business support people in, in the organization to look at your education programs and how you're supporting um, people in that education programs. KPIs and targets. So the age old saying of what you measure, you manage, um, I think is really, really important here. Um, I'm a really big believer of, I would like to get to a place where we don't have to have KPIs and targets, but we're still in a position where we need KPIs and targets, uh, whether it's KPIs towards gender equity, whether it's KPIs towards social inclusion or disadvantaged workers coming into your organization or KPIs around some other type of target. It's really important to keep these front of mind uh, because what you do measure, you do manage. Um, we can try and do it organically, but uh, data tells us that naturally it probably doesn't occur as much as um, it would if we had those set KPIs and targets. Set stretch targets, um, even. You know, th these, are, these are things that we want to be aspirational and we want to try and achieve. Um, listen, listen to the people in your organization. Your people are your best um, pulse in terms of where your organization is at and why people want to come and work for, for you. Uh, we talk about things um, like um, exit surveys and um, uh, the data when people come into the organization, but listening to people when they're actually in it, they call it stay conversations as an example. Have those conversations. Why are people coming to work for you? Um, what is attractive, attractive about people coming and working at your organization? Listen to them. If we're talking about you know an avenue such as sort of diverse talent, Listen to that diverse talent. What, are they, what is it that makes them feel safe at work? What's, what makes them feel like they have a sense of belonging? Um, is it the community? Um, is it the, the manager? Is it, what is it? Listen to them and understand what it is. I think listening go a long way into sort of bridging that skills gap and, and bringing that into an organization. Um, I've got the dollar sign up there. Um, I think nothing in this life you know, comes for free. So certainly um, addressing 
skill shortages, uh, not by just throwing money at it, but making sure we're spending the money in the right way. I encourage people to, you know, sponsor that breakfast, you know, go to that careers expo, um, invest in that cadetship program. Um, all these things cost money. You know, spend the money on the partnerships with your career seekers, your, your asylum seeker resource centers, those types of places as well. I think um, focusing where the spend is and where the budget is in terms of trying to address skill shortages um, really needs to happen. It, 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 there is certain programs we can put in place that obviously come at a low dollar target, but certainly if the business would like to progress and, and achieve and, and, and challenge um, the norm, um, certainly investing and, and um, focusing where that, that spend is going. Um, the attraction piece, um, you know, attraction and retention sort of go hand in hand. Um, can we attract from uh, different industries, as an example? You know, Metro Trains as an organisation have been quite successful in attracting from uh, the automotive industry in the declining space, I think, in particular. Um, during COVID, Metro Trains was successful in actually getting a few pilots um, that have been grounded across to be train drivers. Um, can we look at similar industries where we can upskill um, or retrain people, I think in particular, um, there's always an avenue for there. I guess double-edged sword is that everyone's already stretched, so we need to make sure we focus our energy. If we're bringing in new people, we've got the support there to be able to, um, to bring them up, otherwise they're just gonna be left behind. Um, retain, so this is a really big focus for not just Metro, but any organization, I think at the moment, that the balance is probably shifting a little bit in terms of the attraction piece versus the retention piece, but, is there an opportunity to look at your internal mobility piece? Is there an opportunity to look at, um, you know, cross pollinating people from one division to another division? Again, bringing it back to the upskilling or retraining. I think there's a really big focus in terms of um, why people stay um, and what people want um, from a business. Um, Go international is the next one. So uh, Metro have been very successful in doing a number of uh, international campaigns. We did a campaign over in the, the United Kingdom um, uh, last year where we had some visitors visit over there um, and bring in some people from uh, quite the technical major project space um, across to, to Melbourne as well. We've got a great partnership in place um, with one of our providers uh, that do a lot of our immigration um, and relocation uh, side of things. So having a robust um, global mobility plan and a robust um, mobility plan in general for domestic and international can go a long way. Be purposeful. So be purposeful. What, the, what I mean by be purposeful is that um, nothing just comes because um, it just sort of generally happens, um, especially when trying to address skill shortages. So again, I'll take it from a diverse background perspective. Um, if we speak to managers and leaders in our organisation to make them be aware and, as I said, put the KPIs and targets in front of them, but be purposeful in terms of, hey, we only want to recruit this role um, from a people from diverse background. I only want to advertise this role through our um, social network, um, through our social engagement uh, providers in particular. Um, I want to be able to leverage uh, these these diverse people that we've got. I want to only go to a diverse talent pool that we've we've created within an organisation. So it's been purposeful. It's been front of mind, and and that comes back to that education piece with managers and with leaders in the business. If they're always thinking, okay, well, how can we do things a little bit differently? Um, they're going to be purposeful, you know, in every decision they make, especially when it comes to hiring. Flexibility. I probably don't need to touch on flexibility. It's such a a, a hotly um, discuss topic at the moment. There's pros for it, there's pros against it. There's obviously mandates for some companies for offers versus uh, home life, um, but certainly flexibility um, is a really big topic. So can we offer that um, to attract, uh, say people from you know returning mums uh, back to the workforce? Um, can we look at how we flexibly work, uh, get people to work from overseas or, or, in, or domestically or things like that? So flexibility around work from home office, there's probably a whole broader topic around flexibility we can discuss. So sharing, so sharing is a really interesting one. And what I mean about sharing is I mean sharing employees um, amongst our industry. I think we don't do this well enough. Um, can we partner with industry to not just better um, our own organization, but the broader industry as a whole? Is there an opportunity to swap people to come and do a secondment at one organization, another organization? Is there an opportunity for somebody to go and learn something that they can then bring back to the organization um, as well? So I think 
we get so siloed and so uh, blinkered in terms of how we approach um, our own people, we need to try and open up uh, a little bit more as an industry. And you know, that first sentence at the top in the title, I've got, what can we do? It's certainly what can we do? It's not what can I do? Um, so sharing um, of employees, I think in particular, and, and, and trying to open those lines of communication um, will go down really well. And the upskill or retraining, probably tie that into the attraction piece and the retention piece um, in particular as well. So is there employees within your organization at the moment that you can upskill? Um, is there an opportunity to potentially retrain somebody? Um, we had a number, we've actually had a number of people who have come from the talent acquisition space into the project management space. We've also had a, um, a few people within our um, technical specialist areas that have gone and become train drivers. So is there an opportunity within your organization to upskill or retrain people in particular? So, as I said, no silver bullet here. I could probably put, you know, 50 or 100 um, speech bubbles in here in terms of what we can do to address the skill shortages. But, you know, there's a few in here um, that have been successful for us here at Metro Trains um, and something that, uh, as I said, I, I'm quite passionate to, to work around in particular that diverse uh, diversity piece in particular. So next, I'm going to talk about, um, and probably to the theme of today um, around skill shortage, but also to Eddie's point, um, Eddie's going to talk about later in terms of the program um, with Latrobe uh, and through Engineers Australia as well. Um, and I touched on a few points in regards to the diversity side of things. And, 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 you know, I just wanted to bring out a couple of points in terms of that education piece with managers. And if you want to take um, a few points here, um, which I, I got from the Diversity Council of Australia, um, back to your business um, to try and educate the business on why inclusion is good for business and why inclusion is good for, for individuals. Um, it's a really um, powerful slide uh, regarding these um, these topics and, and, and these uh, this data that's presented here as well. So eight times more likely to innovate, why inclusion is good for business, You know, seven times more likely to be highly effective, three and a half times more likely to work harder, four times more likely to provide excellent customers um, or client service. And then why inclusion is good for individuals. So people are feeling like they're five times more um, likely to be satisfied, two more times likely to have been given constructive performance feedback, four times likely um, to leave. Um, so where that retention piece really comes in and three times less likely to feel work has a neg negative pack, uh, impact on their mental health. So. You know, these eight dot points, again, probably could have had, you know, 16, 24 dot points here in terms of why inclusion is good for, for business and why it's good for, for individuals. We're not just doing this for the sake of doing it. Uh, we're doing it because it actually makes a difference. Um, and this is really where we need to change the dial a little bit in terms of that education piece. It's going from, we need to do this because we need a ticker box to actually, we need to do this because it's the right thing for our business to thrive. Next one I wanted to, to talk about, um, and this is uh, I think the second last slide that I've got here, is I wanted to talk about how um, Metro as an organization uh, keeps its sort of house in order. And the reason why I've, I've done that for all your engineers out there is I've built a sort of house. Um, design is definitely not my strong point, as you can see. Um, but look, I wanted to just comment um, what we've talked about previously in terms of our d &I strategy and how we can um, potentially bridge that gap when it comes to skill shortages um, as well. So, you know, Metro trains Melbourne's values and, and people plan if we start at the bottom. You know, foundation of, of Metro as an organisation is built on its values and strategy plans. Um, and this is no different to any organisation out there. Without these foundations, it's near impossible to make any changes or difference. Next up, you've got the management uh, awareness, commitment and behaviour. Um, so again, that theme that I talked about earlier around education, getting the education with the, the managers and with the organization um, to commit to what they're actually saying and actually act on the, um, what they're actually saying as well. Um, it needs to be led from the front. If you don't have management, management buy-in or leader buy-in, um, it's very, very hard to change anything. Uh, and then what you've got is um, once you've got that buy-in and commitment from the leaders, you can put the building blocks uh, for attracting, retaining and developing diverse talent uh, in there. So it's a fairly simplistic way of looking at it, but if you build on your values, get the company, the business buy-in, put the strategies in place, then you can ultimately make a difference and make that change. Your people are your best asset when it comes to attracting and retaining talent within your organization. 
if an employee has a good experience while they're working for you, then that's just going to organically grow within um, the environment that they're working in. So if you keep on top of that um, and you've got that buy and people are actually bought into what you're trying to achieve and what your end goal actually is, um, then it's going to be an exciting place uh, for people to want to come and work. Um, and the final slide on here is a couple of specific examples of where we had some, some great diverse talent come into our organisation um, to bridge, as I said, that skill shortage that we initially had in the engineering space. So GATA and, and EHAB were part of the 2021 um, engineering program, which I talked about through Level Crossing. Um, they went on the 18 month program, got some practical um, as well as some um, academic uh, experience um, through Swinburne University, uh, worked in the 18 month program, um, Gard is now a, a communications engineer within Metro Trains working full time and EHAB is a site engineer working on one of our level crossing programs um, full time as well. So it is a program that I'm super passionate about. But look, I I, um, I just encourage you all to think, think outside the box, think a little bit differently how we can do things differently. Go back to the business, try and sell that back to the business um, as well, because um, these sorts of stories uh, can really impact um, not just the individuals themselves, but a whole uh, bunch of people around them as well, giving that inspiration to want to do things a little bit differently. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I will do, a, as I said, a, a final sort of plug. Um, we do have a careers hub, a link to there for, for all our sort of up-to-date careers um, and available positions at the moment. Definitely follow Metro Trains on LinkedIn, um, send a connection quest through. Um, as I said, I'm obviously sticking around for the Q&A a little bit later. If there's any questions that you've got, please um, put them in the chat or, or direct them to me later. Otherwise, if you want to catch up, post this and have a discussion around anything we've talked about today. If you want some ideas around how to set up certain programs and things like that, um, I'm always open because I think as an industry as a whole, uh, we really need to um, go out there and, and work together to make the change. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle, for your input. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Eddie Kostovic. Eddie is an academic and director of the Work Integrated Learning Program in the School of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences at La Trobe University. With a passion for engineering, science, education, entrepreneurship, innovation, and commercialization, Eddie is a highly driven, organized, and energetic engineer with the ability to deliver exceptional project outcomes. Additionally, he established the La Trobe Innovation and Entrepreneurship Foundry and manages one of Australia's most distinctive and prosperous work integrated learning initiatives. Please welcome Eddie Kostovic. Thank you very much, Alicia, for the introduction. Uh, furthermore, I'd just like to say a couple of things that will be relevant to this presentation. So although I have an engineering background, a technical background, and I'm still involved very much in technical projects, um, I, I've been involved in business for a long time, uh, along with my brother, we've run numerous companies from civil, structural, electrical engineering, as well as other forms of consulting. And the reason I put that out there is because I try to put myself in the position that many of you find yourself in, whether you're in HR, marketing, business, um, and other technical roles in your organizations. It also has given me an opportunity to build really good relationships with the companies over the years that we've worked with at La Trobe University. And so I, I feel that I'm adequately equipped uh, to continue running this program and continue growing the program here at the Trobe University, which you'll hear more about uh, shortly. So the Trobe University is a top one university worldwide. We've uh, risen in rankings over the last 10 years. I've been at La Trobe for almost 20 years now uh, as a student, first of all, and then as an academic uh, later on. And I've seen La Trobe really grow in terms of its abilities to include a very diverse group of student cohorts, including you know, migrants, first and family, uh, regional uh, students from all over Victoria. We are a statewide university. We have campuses all over the state, but we offer engineering in Melbourne and our Bandura campus, as well as uh, our Bendigo campus. But we draw students from all over the state. We also draw students from interstate, but let's uh, be very clear on the fact that we run a V corridor from Melbourne upwards north northwest towards Mildura, and northeast towards uh, towards the mountains. And so that means that we get a very diverse population and we do, do have campuses in smaller towns across the state, which allow us to engage with the local communities. So the richness of diversity is really something that I've enjoyed uh, working with La Trobe University and something that I think 
many of the companies that we work with have enjoyed recruiting and providing that diversity in their uh, recruitment uh, pipelines as well. And Latrobe Engineering, you know, we have a very rich history. We've had engineering <clears throat> at the campus for a very long time. If we look back into our Bendigo campus, which was the Bendigo School of Mines, we can go back to approximately 150 years. But engineering at our Melbourne campus has existed for 40 plus years, so almost since the late 1960s. We have a very rich history in engineering education, but we've also taken our own very distinct flavor of how we educate young graduates and how we put them into various organizations across the state. What makes our, our programs very, very unique? Well, partly because we have a very specific program in engineering, work integrated learning, which has been developed in specifics to the needs of companies. So over the last 10 years, I've been running our work integrated learning program alongside our uh, work experience programs. And all these interactions have really led us to understand what companies really want, as opposed to what universities think companies want. And so we've developed a very distinct type of undergraduate engineering degree, a very broad degree. We, we like to say multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary in nature that really develops students' critical thinking uh, as opposed to you know the classic read from a book, apply in a problem. We still teach students, of course, the fundamentals of engineering, but we'd like to think that our students are much more well-rounded and bring uh, the ability to communicate, work in teams, resolve conflict a lot better than what they would historically from our uh, cl classic approach to education. And exceptional professional integrity and safety culture is really big on our agenda. That's something that many companies have always pushed us to be involved in. And so we've really embedded that throughout our undergraduate and postgraduate degrees from first year all the way through to graduation. We're very much focused on what happens between industry and research. We would try to bridge that gap as closely as possible. The work integrated learning program that we've been running at Latrobe has been really sort of a great bridge for con connecting academics with industry via the student cohorts that we've been placing into companies. And uh, we try to really teach our students how to be innovative in the workplace. We've introduced two subjects at the undergraduate level, uh, ideas to innovation and engineering enterprise. In, in, in the sort of meat of the degree where we believe that students will really develop those out of the box uh, skills that they need to be able to tackle complex challenges in the 21st century, uh, and specifically the challenges that we're facing as a nation, but also industries that are transforming from the traditional, for example, manufacturing industries to the digital uh, manufacturing industry. So there's a lot of change going on and we really try to keep up with that in placing our students in the best possible position to seek employment. So why, why the Migrant Bridging Program? Well, for the last, I'd say six or seven years, our work integrated learning program at La Trobe University, where we place students into industry for periods of six months or more, have really grown and really expanded. And unfortunately, we were in a very peculiar position where undergraduate student numbers are growing, but growing very slowly but the demand from industry is growing very rapidly. And as many of you have experienced yourself, COVID really exposed, uh, I guess, the shortage of talent that we've had, which has been around for a very long time. And I believe my colleague Alicia has spoken about that in detail. We really want to address this gap. And we know that we can't address that gap simply by going out to schools and promoting engineering as a profession. We've, we've done that for a very long time, not only La Trobe University, but all of our colleagues across the state and across the country. Unfortunately, that number is growing again very slowly. So while we're promoting engineering, colleagues from other disciplines are promoting those disciplines. And as a result of that, we, we're very competitive in securing um, students for various programs. So one way to address this particular shortage of engineering talent in the nation is to find ways that we can really provide migrants, skilled migrants, a better opportunity at finding employment. And that doesn't just mean doing very good matchmaking or finding ways to position these individuals in front of your organizations. It means upskilling them and it means really helping them transition into the Australian workplace. So the, the problem really at its core is that the Australian industry is suffering a huge skill shortage and that's really due to the limited number of graduates entering the field. So we need to take these migrants who are floating around, who are applying uh, to come to Australia, uh, getting approval to come into Australia, but then finding themselves in this, what we call the neutral zone, 
where they simply are finding it difficult to make that first step or at least knock on doors. And part of it is the cultural adjustment to the Australian workplace market. And part of it is that applications are not tailored to particular industries and so on. Of course, soft skills can sometimes be a challenge as well. In many cases, they are quite a challenge. And so they need to be addressed as well. So what we're proposing here really to address some of these challenges is we're working towards launching a program which is really focused at developing migrants' skills, not only while they're in uh, the program, but prior to the program to make them more attractive and to make them more acceptable uh, in terms of a recruitment for organizations such as yours uh, and make everyone else's job much easier. So making it easier for employers to access this pool of talent because that's not an easy thing to do. And thanks to our, our friends at Engineers Australia, we have a significant list of talent that is essentially uh, waiting uh, and wanting to be placed into organizations, but not knowing how to take that first step. So we have access to that migrant pool, the skilled migrant pool from you know, bachelor's and master's uh, qualifications. Uh, we really want to work on this workforce development. So we know that this can help ensure the industry has a continued pipeline of talent flowing into it. And really it's a mixed economy where our undergraduate students, local students are graduating and being placed into organizations alongside the skilled migrants. So one does not replace the other. And as we know, your organizations as well are also very diverse in recruitment. So the migrants would be one talent pool, the undergraduates would be another talent pool. And of course you'd have individuals who have gone to other organizations and want to come back into another organization such as yours. So really we wanna be as diverse as possible. And we understand that this is a very, very big talent pool that has not been uh, taken advantage of as we speak for the way that we would like to. We need to identify ways to support the employment of overseas qualified engineers. And that really means that we work closely with organizations such as yours uh, to find the right opportunities for them, to match them to the right organization. But also from our end, we need to ensure that we are preparing them in an adequate way to really alleviate some of the challenges which we've seen in the past few years and also working closely with our industry partners. We know exactly where the problems have occurred in the past when it comes to skilled migrants finding you know, successful uh, employment or short-term or long-term employment in industry. So how do we foresee this program working? Uh, I will showcase a couple of flow diagrams to really explain how it all fits together. But essentially uh, these skilled migrants, or we call them global engineering talents, as Engineers Australia likes to refer to uh, these individuals, they will basically be in a 12 month program and that program will consist of a mixture of education uh, components at La Trobe University, as well as a very significant and quite, I say chunky industry based placement. This is where you would come in. And I'll talk about how that comes together uh, in the program. Uh, number two is an increased skilled migrant understanding of the Australian workplace and culture. So at La Trobe University, we will play a quite large role in preparation of these skilled migrants in being at least somewhat ready for what is going to be uh, their workplace for the next three, six, 12 months, depending on what sort of arrangement we come to with the organizations. But there is a cultural adjustment that needs to happen. And we, we are going to work very closely with yourself and other industry partners that we've already worked with to ensure that we are ticking the boxes and at least ensuring that these uh, skilled migrants come in with the basics covered so that they can much quicker readjust to the workplace that they're going into. So this gives, gives skilled migrants a uh, really valuable work experience through a placement in an Australian company. So irrespective of whether these individuals end up staying in your organization or end up leaving your organization, we believe that the sector overall will win as a result of these migrants being skilled up, or at least to the Australian workplace environment, they'll be much more ready to tackle their next career. Um, there is a practical and there's also a face-to-face -face training component at the university, which will happen prior to the migrants entering uh, the, the industry. Uh, there's also a component which will happen simultaneously while they are on placement uh, with the organization. So there is quite a mixed approach to doing this. And this, the diagram, which I'll show you in a second, will, will explain that in a lot more detail. Overall, the migrants will spend approximately 800 hours with your organization over a period of time that we come to agree with, but approximately uh, six to 12 months would be the ideal uh, sort of arrangement. And while they're in your organization, they are also completing, as I said, some engineering discipline specific 
content as well as some content which helps them readjust to the workplace. And lastly, there's a practical training component which ensures that the migrants uh, are basically positioned to succeed in the organization uh, that they're placed into. So this diagram will make a little bit more sense than uh, the dot points previously. That was just to give you a little bit of an introduction. So if we work our way from the left to the right, you can see the skilled migrants would commence the program. I'm not going to talk about how the actual recruitment and preparation happens up until that point. We'll talk about that in a slide later on. But assuming that uh, at this point we have a skilled migrant enter the program, they will enter a, what we call an upskilling or reskilling intensive delivery at La Trobe University, which will consist of various uh, content that we have developed ourselves, as well as content that we are going to develop or absorb from our partnering organizations. So the way I want you to think about this is, uh, is when you bring in a new employee, whether it's an undergraduate, postgraduate student or a skilled migrant, there is an onboarding period, which can be quite intense sometimes. And then there is that readjustment period to the actual workplace. So we would like to take the most important elements of what you feel would be critical for these skilled migrants to know prior to entering your organization. So think of it as an incubation at La Trobe University prior to commencement of employment in your organization. So what can we do on our end to better prepare them to enter the workplace? We have some experience in this area because we've been doing this very long time with undergraduates and postgraduate students at La Trobe. But we also know that the skilled migrant group, while they bring in significant experience in the workplace, from three years upwards to sometimes 15 or 20 years of experience in industry, they may not have the understanding of the Australian workplace and safety culture and other elements that we find very, very important prior to commencing employment and organization. So we want to take this six weeks of intensive delivery very, very seriously and work closely with you to ensure that the content there is exactly what we feel is critical prior to them to arriving in your organization. As you can see, the whole program is uh, labeled as 12 months from end to end. So this six week at La Trobe University delivery does not necessarily have to be a face-to-face -face delivery. This could also be a hybrid delivery. It could also be a fully online delivery. That part is yet to be figured out based on where, this, where these skilled migrants are located. And what happens after these six weeks? Well the candidate will then commence what we call a full-time or 800 hour industry placement. In our case, it's a work integrated learning placement. In parallel, they have this, you can see the difference between these gray and red uh, boxes is the red ones are industry partner based and the gray ones are Latrobe University based. So while they are on placement with your organization for the 800 hours, they're also doing upskilling and reskilling through Latrobe University online delivery. And this online delivery would happen over that entire period of time. It would not be an intense delivery because the primary focus of the candidate is to be placed in your organization and to learn on the job. So as work integrated learning implies, they're learning in a work related environment and they're translating that into uh, assessments. They're translating that into uh, skills that are at least somewhat uh, assessed and measured by La Trobe University as a higher education provider. So we work in partnership with our industry partners to ensure that the candidates are learning what they need to learn in the organization, but also that it articulates into uh, an overall AQF uh, framework. So essentially enabling us to provide them with a degree, a master's degree, when they complete this entire program. So as you can see that the gray area in the first segment involves personal and professional development or what we call work readiness. So communication, teamwork, research, project management, workplace, OHS, and a lot more of, of, of that. What happens after this period? Uh, if the candidate has satisfied uh, you know, the organization's expectations, they can then continue into what we call direct employment. So direct employment would mean that the candidate does no longer need to be under any form of agreement between La Trobe University Engineering and your organization. You would then be at your own discretion responsible for employing these candidates directly, whether it's a casual, part-time or full-time contract that is completely at the discretion of your organization. However, once these 800 hours are completed and you decide to yes or no, irrespective of whether it's a yes or a no, the candidate then continues on in what we're calling either second semester or second half of the program. 
and they would continue to do upskilling and reskilling in two additional subjects at Latrobe University, which would then go into professional workplace project components. So while in the first half of the program, we're focusing more on the teamwork, research, project management, and workplace OHS, in the second part, we'd be focusing more on the actual uh, technical skills of the, of the graduates. So we'd be looking to put subjects in place that would complement what they're learning in the workplace from a technical perspective. And so there's a well-balanced mix of enterprising skills and technical skills that the candidates would bring together uh, prior to you know, graduating. And so the graduation would happen post two periods here, and you can see the candidates uh, basically graduate with a master's from La Trobe University, but in that they need to complete these 800 hours of industry relevant experience. So I guess the risk factors here are, of course, that when you take on a candidate, that the candidate does not necessarily meet uh, the requirements that you have after the 800 hours. And that is also perfectly fine uh, from both ends. As you know, there's risk involved in recruiting candidates, irrespective of whether it's free university programs such as this, or whether it's through an agency. What is in it for the candidates? Well, after 800 hours, whether it's a yes or no under the satisfactory uh, label there, if no, the candidate has 800 hours of work experience in Australian in an Australian work environment, which means that they are much more likely to be employed by another industry partner in the sector than they were prior to these 800 hours. So there is, a, I will say, a corporate social responsibility element in that we are training candidates in hope that they become part of our workplace uh, organization. But on the other hand, if they don't, for whatever reason, then we are feeding back into the sector and creating more employable candidates overall in the Australian workplace environment. But I will say this, that in our experience in the last seven years of running programs such as this, about 85% of candidates who go through this program end up staying for a period of at least 12 months to 24 months uh, in the organization where they did their work in integrated learning. And more than 60% of them stay three years plus. So those are the statistics that I'm working with based on about 700 or 800 uh, candidates that we have placed over the last uh, seven or years or so. So I have confidence in that if we run through this program in this manner, that there is a high probability that these candidates will stay in your organization and will stay there for quite a time uh, contributing to the organization. I'm going to explain a little bit more about how this is all going to run. So I'm just going to skip to the next slide. Apologies. Okay, here we are. So the, the learning outcomes of the program really are the students will graduate with a master's degree, and that master's degree is a unique blend of industry and academic deliverables. So while they're in your organization, the kind of learning that you're going to see is kind of learning that you would normally see from undergraduate and postgraduate students that you may take on into your graduate programs. But what we will do on our end is we will complement that. We will uh, teach them a lot about the communication. So you know, teaching them effective workplace communication, uh, creating resumes, mastering the interviewing skills and so on. That's part of the intensive training that we will do on our end. Uh, Industry-based placement, of course, prepares them for employability. Uh, the teamwork component, excelling in collaborative environments and effective team participation uh, is a crucial element of what we do at La Trobe University and something that we prepare our undergraduate students quite heavily on. Uh, there's a lot of career development involved as well, understanding you know, their career uh, trajectories, understanding the different kind of roles that they can play in industry from the consulting roles uh, to the project management type roles to site engineering roles. So, you know, undergraduate engineers often don't understand what is what is waiting for them when they graduate, the types of different engineering roles that are out there. So we will do a lot of that work in preparing them to understand the kind of role that they can have in an organization so that when they arrive at your doorstep, they are much more ready uh, to, uh, to, to embrace a particular role. Workplace law, you know, understanding the Australian legal system and how, how that impacts the day-to-day -day of their employment and their responsibilities as engineers in Australia. And a lot of that, of course, is leveraged off Engineers Australia from uh, the Re National Engineering Register to becoming a chartered engineer, to understanding all the legal implications uh, in our profession. Health and safety, we talked about earlier on, a very big part of what we do at La Trobe University, basically embedding that as part of their day-to-day -day culture to always think about safety regardless of what they're doing and understanding also the implications that safety culture has, not only on themselves, but also on their peers and also on the organization that they work in. Understanding organizational needs and meeting organizational requirements with finesse, and of course, professionalism, which is really, really broad, 
but starting from simple things like writing emails in a professional manner, working all the way through to you know, professional con conduct in complex environments, in meetings, in negotiations, uh, in project scoping, uh, in quantification of various roles and so on. So quite a diverse uh, set of, I guess, learning outcomes that we're driving through the program. So the value proposition to the sector and stakeholders, I'll just pop this up simultaneously. The reason I put this up is really to make everyone understand that is uh, we all have skin in the game. So La Trobe University, Engineers Australia, and our industry partners, we have a very important role to play here and we must work in symbiosis to make this succeed. For years, I've been watching um, you know, people talk about this and we've really had a big challenge in front of us in terms of how we develop the workforce of the future, how we develop the volume, but also the quality. And often in isolation and many times in panels and discussions and lectures, but not in practice. I believe what we're proposing here really requires all three organizations to work off, or all three stakeholders to work very closely together. And the value proposition to each of us here is quite clear. But I've put up a few bullet points here so that everyone uh, may have a look at it and understand how we fit into this, you know, three part, three part, uh, I guess, partnership. So for Industry and Engineers Australia, it's really helping you access talent. La Trobe University wants to play a role in helping you access that talent. But we're working with Engineers Australia to access this skilled migrant talent pool. So our job then, of course, besides providing the undergraduate and postgraduate students, is to find a way to filter and curate these candidates for employment or for short-term or long-term employment in your organizations. And that's where we want to play a big role. We want to bridge that gap between industry and academia. And I believe we're well positioned to do that given our current experience and our relationship with Engineers Australia, as well as 150 organizations in Victoria that we work with actively as we speak. Uh, Future-proof professional engineers developing the skills that they need uh, for, for the future as opposed to what they need yesterday, increasing and also sustaining that engineering uh, talent pipeline, uh, their community and cultural engagement, uh, cost-effective workforce using government R&D and tax offsets. There are various ways to fund taking on these students. We can talk about that uh, later on. And most importantly, at least from my angle, is diversifying the workforce. One of the interesting facts is that the skilled migrant talent pool really has a large number of females. And I know that we've been working very, very hard in that gender balance, uh, and yet we, we're still not achieving the numbers that we really want to. And not because we don't, we don't have the culture to do that, it's just that we don't have enough female engineering talent in Australia. But what we can say is that the percentage of females in the skilled migrant pool is significantly higher than the number of females that we're graduating from our undergraduate and postgraduate degrees within Australia. So I think that will be a very, very uh, attractive proposition to many of our industry partners, uh, not just because they're females, but because they bring a different mindset into the workforce. And of course, showcasing industry-wide leadership, I think we, we play a, a very big role in showcasing that we're not just working for our own individual organizations in recruiting talent, which of course is our number one priority, but that we are equally contributing back into the sector. And I mentioned the corporate social responsibility earlier, which in this case really is taking on candidates, helping train them or upskill them, retaining a certain percentage of them and sending a certain percentage of them back into that overall engineering talent pool that will be dis distributed across uh, the states in Australia. Of course, for the companies, you know, the reduction in learning uh, time. So I talked about that earlier on, that six week intensive training, which we hope will take some of the pressure away from uh, company uh, learning to the university learning environment. Now, if you're a large corporation, this may not be such an issue for you because you have a large HR team, you have a big uh, team that's preparing candidates as they come into your organization. But what we often find is with the SMEs and even organizations that have 100, 150 employees, they're just not set up to be able to do that type of training. And often it can be quite difficult for them to do that. So we want to play a more active role in that early preparation of candidates before they enter your organization. And in, in order to do that successfully, we have to work much closer with your organization as we have with other organizations. We're gonna make it easy for, for, for you guys to access the talent pool. I've talked about that before. We wanna be able to present that talent to you in a way that doesn't take away you know, millions of hours uh, from your HR team. 
we want to play more of an active role in that. And we've been doing that with our, with our programs for undergraduate and postgraduate uh, students. There's a reduction of risk and employment pathway. Uh, I, I also run a company, so I know it's quite difficult to find talent and it's quite difficult to um, find a good ratio of how much time you spend in recruiting that talent. We can often spend thousands and thousands of dollars with recruitment agencies to find the right talent. And so La Trobe University in this case wants to play that active role in being your partner in recruiting talent. So we're not a recruitment agency. However, we have the ability and the skills to play a role in this particular space. We wanna influence the program uh, developments by including your organization in the actual program content, in the governance and the overall future of the program as well. So we want you to play a much more active role. If you see that this is working for you, then please step in, uh, provide that input. We're very, very open uh, to that type of input. Uh, you know, we want to get companies visibility uh, in, uh, higher to a level at La Trobe University by placing, you know, your branding within the university's uh, environment. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we're currently working through a program called Industry Code Design and Engineering where companies are involved in not only providing lectures and content and workshops and site visits and, and, and employability to students, they're involved in over the entire degree from end to end. And so your company logos and company descriptions are also placed strategically throughout the course structure to show your involvement in curating the content in a way that young people will then aspire to. So not just for young people, but also for these migrants, it's important that they're exposed to the brands throughout their study or throughout their learning period, as opposed to one off when they're ready to graduate and seeking employment. So uh, please take that into consideration. So we want you more involved in that as well. And so for employees, of course, uh, you know, for these young individuals and these skilled migrants, you know, shaping, shaping their careers is what the program will really do. There are mentoring opportunities available um, for your employees to be involved, which means that there is a direct connection with these candidates uh, now and also into the future connecting with students and also migrants, and also finding ways of formally recognizing your employees for being involved in shaping these young individuals and also the migrants. You, you probably have something along those lines in your organization already, but we, we also strongly encourage that type of involvement. So as you can see, there is a lot at stake here and there's a lot for all of us uh, in terms of value propositions, but it's that symbiosis between all three of these that really makes this program uh, run successfully. So probably one of the most interesting elements of this program is you might be wondering, well, how does that whole uh, early stage work in terms of how do you get these candidates to our front door? And I can explain that uh, with this diagram here. So what we what we will plan to do is this. Uh, skilled migrants will apply. There'll be an expression of interest in which they will apply. This talent pool will come directly from Engineers Australia. Engineers Australia has a very large database or skilled migrants applying and working through various programs to seek employment in Australia. So we will access this talent pool. This talent pool will apply. They'll put an expression of interest to this program. And then the real work starts. And of course, there is an eligibility check that happens right up front. And after the eligibility check is confirmed and the student of the candidates are eligible, we then go through a very, very tedious process, a very time consuming process, but a very valuable one, nevertheless which is the assessment and ranking. So my team and I, we've been doing this for undergraduate and postgraduate students for the last seven years. We have the engineering technical uh, background as well, as well as HR backgrounds and as well as program experience. So that gives us a unique position to be able to take this talent pool that's arriving and assess it in accordance to expectations from our organizations. So in the early stages here, your organization will put an expression of interest. And for hypothetic, hypothetical situation, you may say that we're looking for two, two candidates, uh, electrical engineering, or let's say the rail industry signaling or something along those lines. It might be civil engineering, specifically related to hydraulics. And then you would provide us with either a PD or specific skill sets that you're looking for. So that is company requirements. Once we have the company requirements and we have approximately, let's say two positions in your organization, then at least we know what you're looking for. Based on the number of candidates that are applying, we then have this role of matching in part two. So prior to matching, we will do the assessment and ranking. And the assessment and ranking really is based on a whole lot of categories uh, that we go through, but they're internally ranked into groups based on what we feel 
are the strongest candidates in terms of their skills, in terms of how they presented themselves, and in terms of how they stand based on their past experiences. This assessment will also be in line with what your organizations are looking for. So it's not that we're going to be doing this blindly without you, but it's going to be in symbiosis in that sense. But the matching part is probably the most intense and time consuming component because it does really require uh, doing a little bit of, uh, let's say, mixing and matching between the company's requirements and the candidates that have applied. So we could have potentially three, four, five hundred candidates, and we could potentially have, let's say, a hundred organizations. So my job as director of the program is to find the right matches. And those matches will then be presented to your organization. We will always present more candidates than what you're looking for to give you an ability to pick from a pool of talent. That pool of talent, of course, will be curated based on your requirements. So as we do this over and over and we work closer and closer together, we then come to an equilibrium or essentially a true understanding of each other's requirements in terms of getting these candidates out there. Because we've been doing this now for seven years in the work in a graduate learning environment for undergraduate and postgraduate students, I am very confident that after one or two iterations that we will really get this to a point where we truly understand each other and that once our matching is complete, that you will be relatively satisfied with the candidates that we're presenting to you. If we're in a position where we don't have the right candidates, we will communicate that back to you. We won't present you blindly candidates just for the sake of presenting candidates. We'll work very closely with you on that end. So think of us as a recruitment agency with a higher education uh, uh, say umbrella. We work very closely with you, but we also have the academic as well as the industry experience to do that. Once we shortlist a bunch of candidates, we will present them to you. You will interview these candidates as you would normally interview candidates for any type of role at your organization. And then most based on that, you will let us know that we liked candidate one and two, candidates three, four, and five were not, uh, didn't meet our specifications, or we liked all five of them, and unfortunately we can only take on two, which is also very good feedback. The, the only thing that we ask of our industry partners is, please be as descriptive as possible with feedback to us, as well as the candidates, because really this is a learning environment for them as part of this master's program. So whether they get in or don't get into your organization, it's probably the first interview they're going to have, or maybe the first interview in Australia. And that's very much in line with where we want them to be to learn. So they will, from that, take that experience and become better and better. If the candidates are successful and you are happy with taking them on, there is a contract put into place and the contract will then allow that candidate to spend 800 hours in your organization in accordance to the work in a grad learning model and the skilled migrant program commences. So there is no risk involved whatsoever to your organization because until you find the right candidate, you are basically not obliged to do anything but interview some candidates and have a look at them. So we're pretty much taking on uh, the vast majority of the risk here by doing the assessments and rankings and matchings and so on. And we will then enter into an agreement and work our way through uh, the program and find the best possible way to, to give you the best possible candidates uh, into the program. And as I said, why is Latrobe a reliable and capable partner executing this program? It is this seven years or so of running this work in a greater learning program in this shape. We are the first university in Australia to have an undergraduate and postgraduate degree accredited where work integrated learning is uh, an integral part of our educational system. So it is not something that is done as an elective. It is not something that is done in addition to the four or five years of engineering study at Latrobe University. It is a core component of our education. So we're the first to get that accredited with Engineers Australia, and it took a very long time to find the right model. So we have the experience, we have the accreditation framework for it, and we have the right teams and structures set up to be able to deliver this. I myself work on the front end of all of this. I work very closely with all of our industry partners. Many of you, will, if you decide to be part of this program, be working with me directly, will be in direct communication, and I have a team that's supporting the program. But I think what really makes us stand out and why I believe we're the most capable team to be able to deliver this is the employability factor. So as a result of our work in a graduate learning program at the Trobe University, in the last seven years, we've gone from about 70% or 71% employability of our undergraduate and postgraduate students to now a record 95.6% of our engineering undergraduates found full-time employment within four months of graduation. And Basically, the numbers don't lie, as the statement says here. We are now number one in Victoria 
for employability and number two in Australia for employability. So that gives us a, gives us a lot of confidence that we can enter the skilled migrant space with confidence of being able to do what we did with undergraduate and postgraduate students and also do that with this skilled migrant cohort. In fact, I'm feeling more optimistic because we know that the skilled migrants already have various work experience, whereas undergraduate and postgraduate students that we work with have little to no work experience in the past, which makes it a lot harder to work with them and get them to that level. And of course, if you, um, if you don't believe me and my statements, you can always go to the quilt, uh, quilt uh, assessments and have a look uh, for the sake of other universities in Victoria. I didn't, I didn't put the logos or the, or, the, or the actual institutions there, but you can see La Trobe University sits at a very healthy 95.6%. And again, this is no disrespect to any other institutions. It is really to say that we have really paid attention to what our industry partners are saying. We have restructured our programs. We have rethought how we teach undergraduate engineers and postgraduate engineers for employability. And that has really gotten us to a point of where we can proudly say that we're number one in Victoria with a very high percentage of undergraduates and postgraduates employed in the sector. And lastly, I think it's important to, to really showcase how widespread we are with our undergraduate and postgraduate students. I didn't include the maps of other states. We have placed students from Victoria in New South Wales, in South Australia and Queensland. Uh, I don't think we've had anyone in Western Australia and Northern Territory, but again, that's not, uh, that's not really up to us. It's up to the companies that we work with, but we have a very big regional footprint. So if you have an organization or if your organization has offices across the state or regional parts of New South Wales, Queensland and so on, Rest assured, we have a lot of experience in working with regional partners as well. And we understand that the challenges that they face are vastly different to the organizational challenges that companies in the metropolitan areas face. So vast majority of our companies come from, of course, metropolitan Melbourne, but we have a significant number of partners uh, across the state. We've also worked with international offices. So if you have an opportunity for international placement of candidates, uh, rest assured, we've worked with international placements as well. I won't go through this in, in detail, but it's really to just show you a bit of diversity in terms of who we've worked with in the past, uh, from smaller manufacturers such as ceramic oxide fabricators in Bendigo uh, to you know, the, the, the Furphy Engineering, which some of you might be aware of, uh, family-owned business for 150 years, um, water carts uh, that were you know, basically delivered in a long time ago, and now they're doing all sorts of incredible work in central Victoria as well to a global company such as Nyris that's working in you know, robotics and automation. Um, I believe they're a Danish company who now also have offices in Australia and other parts of the world. Uh, to councils such as you know, the Greater, Greater Bendigo Council, to some of the largest defence contractors such as Talis and BAE. So we've worked with many industry partners and we have the ability to find ways to prepare students for different sectors and so on. And our students, of course, have found employment in various organizations. And I always proudly say that we work very closely with all of these industry partners, including ones that are often neglected as a result of their geographic location. For example, Majura Rural City Council, you know, Nicholas Moore, who happened to be a La Trobe University student, who ended up working in Mildura, where he happens to be from. So we, we found that perfect match in that case there. Uh, to other partners uh, in manufacturing, such as AG Coombs and service engineers, all the way through to our know, partners at Metro. There's a always a very proud photo. We see there uh, Dan Andrews speaking to our students and the tunnel. To students that actually moved from metropolitan Melbourne, such as Marcus uh, Churovich there, who moved to Furphy Engineering, which is another success story. To six international students who could very easily have been skilled migrants in this case here working in ceramic oxide fabricators in Bendigo and helping push out commercial products in central Victoria. We have a lot of success stories. We have a lot of experience uh, that we can't, of course, present in this uh, short presentation, but rest assured uh, that we are here to partner with you. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to my presentation, and I hope to be able to answer any questions uh, that you may have, but also please feel free to comment and uh, provide any discussion points in helping us improve uh, this particular program. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that um, presentation, Eddie. I think you really nailed it um, when you talked about we need to do this in collaboration 
And it's so fantastic to see that La Trobe University has um, designed this program with industry in mind, um, focusing on employability. It, it links back to what Lyle was talking about in his presentation um, on the importance of inclusion and um, and there's a whole suite of things that we can all do um, and working in partnerships really is one of those. Um, so thank you. It's now the chance for the audience to get involved. Please continue to put your questions into the chat box. Um, and thank you to those have, who've already submitted questions. We're going to jump into the Q&A session now. And I'm going to throw the first couple of questions across to Kyle. Um, they do focus on the skills um, that industry is looking for. So, Kyle, what are your thoughts on um, the career stages that people are looking to, that industry is looking to hire? Um, do you think that they're looking, they're open to hiring late stage career engineers? Yeah, thanks, Alicia. It's a, it's a good question and, and one that I have been asked a, a few times and uh, conversations I've had internally here within the organisation. I guess rail as a business um, and as an industry is fairly, um, has been around for a long, long time. So people that have actually been in the rail industry for 40, 50 plus years are obviously on their way to, to retirement, but we need to retain that talent and that information within our organisation somehow. So yeah. given the current conditions around skill shortages, we've seen some focus um, and I've talked to industry partners around this as well as is you're looking at retirees that have potentially got that um, skill set to be able to come and maybe mentor the next generation, be part of things like graduate programs and cadet programs in particular. Um, the technology is really moving really quickly. Um, we've got an old network from a rail perspective here in Victoria that's 50 to 100 years old. So we still need to be able to connect the new technology into the old technology here. So yes, um, the the quick answer is yes, we're certainly open and businesses um, should still be open to looking at people from that older generation um, later in their careers. However, again, it's back to my point during the presentation when I spoke around the education piece and the buy-in from, from managers around wanting to do something a little bit differently. So um, as people support functions, whether it's talent acquisition, whether it's um, learning and development, whether it's you know people business partnering, as an example, there's an opportunity there to think outside the box um, in how we um, bring people into our organisation and whether or not that's people from the older generation, whether it's diverse talent, as Eddie spoke in his presentation, skilled migrants um, are really good opportunities. So, yes, 100%, I think we should be looking um, at anybody and um, everybody um, who's got those skills to be able to come and, and add value into our organisations. And, Kyle, what specific skills should an undergraduate engineer primarily be focusing on developing? Yeah, look, I, I love this question and I've been to multiple, um, you know, grad events, career events that I've spoken to, some really unbelievable people doing their degrees, um, people that are way smarter th than I am. Um, and I love speaking to these types of people because uh, they fill me with such confidence that the next generation coming through um, is really going to leave a, a strong legacy um, in everything they do. Um, First thing I would say, Alicia, would be attitude um, and something we hire for quite a lot, especially in that sort of early career stage is, is we, we really hire for attitude, um, not so much for, for the technical um, capability point of view. Yes, take technical capability is certainly important, but people starting their careers um, in the outset, we really encourage that really strong attitude, um, positive thinking, positive mentality, collaboration, stakeholder management, Time management is a really key one um, as well. Be curious, um, I think, is is a really good um, saying that I'd like to, to kind of talk to graduates about and undergrads about is be curious, ask questions. That's the only way you're going to learn. I continue to learn 
every single day by talking to people that have been in the industry for a, a long, long time. Um, don't be afraid to fail either. Um, be able, being able to fail um, is actually a mark of, of how we can then bounce back and, and do something a little bit differently. But um, we we sometimes are a bit too afraid to, to fail. But look, that's the way we're going to learn. Um, we need to surround ourselves with people that uh, will support us through that. So um, yeah, attitude is everything. Um, in my opinion, I think be curious and um, yeah, don't be afraid to fail. Thanks so much for sharing that perspective, Kyle. Eddie, the next question I'm going to throw across to you. How is the government addressing the skills shortage? And what do you think? Um, should the government be looking into sorting out onshore engineers um, and focusing less on those who are offshore? Yeah, thanks very much, Alicia. That's a very good question. And uh, obviously, I can't speak on behalf of the government, but I can try to interpret how we perceive this issue and how we're tackling it. So one of the challenges, of course, that I spoke about is the fact that we have this lack of talent coming through the university pipeline. In fact, I wouldn't say lack of talent, but just not adequate volume of talent coming through. And uh, one of the ways that we're trying to address that is by putting into the mix this skilled migrant cohort. So when we talk about skilled migrants, we are not necessarily talking about the incoming skilled migrants. We're referring to the skilled migrants that are already here, that have already been approved uh, basically in Australia for a period of anywhere between a few months to potentially even a few years. So they are here. They are ready to go. They are basically, they've been, a, they've been approved to come to Australia quite a while ago based on their applications and skill sets that they're bringing to the table. So. Part of the question is, are we unblocking this talent pipeline that's already here? And the answer to that is yes. That is our primary focus group at the moment. That's the, that's the uh, people we want to work with. But of course, the government is going to you know, Im import additional uh, engineers through this pipeline of skilled migrants. So one of our goals now is to try to accelerate how quickly we can upskill, retrain, and culturally readjust some of these skilled migrants that are onshore to fill the shortage of skills uh, required in industry, while of course continuing and not putting aside at all uh, the talent pool that we need to create from the local um, students uh, that are on, on, on our campuses. And we need to increase that number effectively over time. And as I said before, this is not a university problem. This is not an Engineers Australia problem. This is not an industry problem. It's all of our problems. So basically we need to work in symbiosis to address this issue and neither of the stakeholders on their own can tackle it adequately because we're shorthanded and we're focused on doing the day-to-day. -day. So you know, I, I appeal to our partners across the country to join, uh, join the effort and really try and bring this uh, talent pool up. So in short, yes, we're addressing this talent pipeline, the skilled migrants that are onshore and unblocking the talent pool from there and pushing it into industry. Thanks, Eddie. I think that that's a really great answer um and, and just to add to that um we know that a lot of these engineers here are suitably qualified and engineers australia undertakes the migration skills assessments on behalf of the of the federal government so employers can actually rest assured that these engineers who are here are coming with um degrees, undergraduate degrees that are equivalent to Australian degrees and, it, and it's programs like this that are going to really help um, connect them in with the, with the employees. I'm going to throw another one across to you, Eddie. Um, are there any programs to support upskilling tradespeople and operators to become engineers? Um, and if not, why yep, not? Another, another, yeah, another great question. Uh, there are, and there are more and more programs out there now in comparison to what they've been in the past. We do realize that there are a significant number of experienced uh, machine operators and individuals that have worked in the engineering ecosystem, but not necessarily qualified as engineers. So there are ways to upskill. Of course, I can only talk about what La Trobe University offers at this stage, but since I'm in contact with a lot of my colleagues, I can, I can assure you there are various initiatives across Australia that enable you to accelerate, uh, I guess, the, the acquisition or putting a higher education degree under your belt uh, at that point. So what we tend to offer is 
um, advanced standings for certain content. So if an undergraduate degree is four years, then you may be eligible for almost up to two years of credit based on your industry experience. This is quite a challenge because as you can imagine, we have this accrediting system that Engineers Australia offers across the country, which means that we can easily look at content from one university, compare it to another and say, this is equivalent to this subject, or this is equivalent to this learning outcome. That is a lot harder to do when you look at what industry is doing versus what we're teaching. It's just not something that we can do very easily. However, that being said, we have done it in the past and we can give credit for certain content or certain learning outcomes from industry uh, to the academic world. So I would highly encourage anyone who is in industry at the moment who is not a qualified engineer but wants to be become a qualified engineer to come and speak to us. We need to look at these cases on a you know, one by one basis. We can't you know, have an umbrella rule for everyone because it really does depend on how long you've worked somewhere, what you've worked on, and whether you can articulate that into learning outcomes. So Engineers Australia is very good at providing frameworks for this part of the accreditation process. And we have competencies that need to be addressed. So we would sit down with you, um, you know, and look at what you've been doing for quite a time and then help you understand how you can put that pen to paper to show us the equivalency and the learning outcomes. You would definitely need to do some content uh, at the universities across a period of probably two years or maybe slightly more, which would then give you a qualified engineering degree from a higher education institution in Australia that is accredited by Engineers Australia and therefore create that pipeline. If you're already in a company, I believe most companies are very supportive of, of uh, employees being upskilled and moving up the food chain. That's definitely something that I've heard numerous times in my engagement with companies all over the state of Victoria. They may even financially support that endeavor for you, but if that's not the case, then I'm pretty confident that a lot of the companies that we work with would very likely uh, want to engage with you as an individual at that, at that point in time to find a way to get their, get you into their organization. So please have a look at whatever institution is doing, but I'm more than happy to look at your one, uh, case one by one uh, if you're happy for me to engage with you post this uh, presentation. Thanks, Eddie. Um, another one for Kyle. What pathways are you aware of for engineers practicing overseas who'd like to fill in the skills shortage gap in Australia? Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Um, something that we at Metro have done over the last few years in particular is, is bring skilled workers across from overseas, um, multiple different countries, predominantly the UK. We, we've brought a lot of people from because they, they slot quite well into the environment here in Australia um, and have worked on a kind of similar projects um, based over in the UK as well. So if we're talking about current people living overseas as opposed to people that are, have got overseas experience living here. Look, the, the biggest issue living overseas and obviously being granted um, work rights here in Australia to, to work. So there is a couple of avenues. Obviously, companies do um, and Metro have in the past um, sponsored employee uh, sponsored um, employees to come out here and, and work here um, in Australia. Um, obviously, there is is skills testing that has to be done through the immigration pathway side of things. So only really for for certain level of roles or specialties of roles that will do that. Um, but certainly, um, we're seeing more and more um, as these sort of major projects, not just here in, in Victoria, but certainly Sydney, Brisbane, um, and some of the rail um, big projects happening over in Western Australia as well. Um, we've seen more and more sort of skilled workers come out um, via sponsorship opportunities. And, and the government has recognised that, that they've increased the number of, um, of visas being issued um, through uh, the Immigration Department in particular. Another avenue that sort of we we kind of threw the idea around here at Metro was um, a, a working holiday type visa. Um, you know that the department, immigration department in particular, have really seen a shift from obviously people post so pre COVID to to sort of what the post COVID world now looks like. So you know they've dropped certain things around. Um, how long a person can work for one employer whilst they're here in Australia. They've also um, increased the number of hours 
um, that people are able to work for an employer whilst they're on a working holiday visa and a couple of other restrictions that they have sort of dropped off that makes it a little bit easier for people to come and, and work on, a, say, an initial 12-month uh, working holiday visa with options to, to extend as well. So potentially getting that working holiday visa on your own accord, getting here locally here in um Victoria or Australia or wherever you're going to be based um, around the country, um, leveraging networks, um, you know, going to industry events uh, such as this in particular, um, you know, getting your personal brand out there on, on social media websites such as LinkedIn and those types of places um, certainly is encouraged. So that's a really um, sort of different way of looking at it. It's kind of more so on the employee um, side of things to get themselves here to Australia first before they find employment. But that's certainly a pathway. And as Eddie touched on as well, you've, you've got the, the skilled migrants. Um, again, the government is looking at how many of those um, are being issued each year around the country. Is there an opportunity to increase that? That discussion still goes on around humanitarian visas um, and things like that as well. But look, programs, once you're here around, you know, the Latrobe program, the um, the EPIC program or the Engineering Pathways Cadetship program I mentioned in my presentation um, is just a really another support and another tool for um, skilled migrant workers to, to get employment here once they hit the ground. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, these talks like this, that we can, you know, create more awareness around these types of programs for businesses to then um, have the initiative to go out and do their own programs as well. Um, and something that I'd love to, to talk to other businesses around is, is how we can replicate these really great programs that we're already currently doing. And rather than having to reinvent the wheel and, and start again, we've already got a really blueprint program that works. Um, let's replicate it. Let's, let's try and get some um, traction and, and, and really see where we can go. Thanks for that, Kyle. Um, we're going to finish up on one final question, and it's a very important one for Eddie. Um, Eddie, there is interest in this program, um, both from individual and industry perspective. Can you share with us how do e how does industry and individuals apply to participate in this program? Yep, probably the most important question after all of the information that we've provided you guys with. It's actually quite simple. I've, I've talked about the, the pipeline and how we're going to basically recruit and match and so on. So I'll address, uh, I'll, I guess, candidates and then uh, partners as well. So basically for candidates, if you're interested in this program, uh, there will be an expression of interest form that will be sent out. And I can talk about the logistics at some other time. But basically, if you've been registered on this, uh, on this, on this webinar, you will definitely have the information sent out to you. And what you need to do is put an expression of interest. That expression of interest then puts you into our system and we will analyze, as I said, your CV, your application details and look at the skills that you bring to the table and then go through that process of you know, checking your eligibility and matching you to potential industry partners that we're working with. So for our industry partners, very similar process. There is an expression of interest on your end as well. It looks slightly differently because it does ask you what you're looking for in terms of candidates, what type of positions, where the positions are based, et cetera, et cetera. There will be a process of digesting all of this information, which my team and I will go through. And then we'll go through a process of matchmaking, as I showed in my presentation, where we will try to, to the best of our abilities, match candidates, their expectations with industry requirements and their expectations, upon which point you will probably receive an email with uh, some details about an interview and you'll go through that interview and then obviously the rest is up to the industry partner and yourself as the candidate to see whether it's the right match post that. The rest is quite simple because we'll go through the Trobe University partnership agreement and you'll commence in the program. So expression of interest will be sent out. I can't exactly give you a spot on date right now, but I suspect it won't be uh, that long after this webinar, after we've completed all of this. So hopefully that'll be sufficient information for you guys to be able to confidently uh, apply to, to the program and I really look forward to reading through all the applications and doing the best that I can to match you to the adequate partner on, on both ends. Well, thank you. That's all that we have time for today. Um, thank you so much, Kyle McLean and Dr. Eddie Kostovic for your your time and your contribution and sharing your, your knowledge with us today. I'd like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Latrobe University, for their support. 
Um, to our participants, thank you for joining. Please complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below to help us improve and plan future sessions. Thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders event. Have a lovely day.